church, God. Graves in the gardens, you're gonna take this. Come on, I want you to see. You turn crazy, bones into armies. You turn bones into armies, seas into high. You turn seas into high. See, you're the remind your soul of his power. You turn crazy, remind your soul of his love. more chorus. Oh, there's nothing. Come on. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better. Church, say this. Say, my hope is in you, Jesus. Say it again. My hope is in you. One more time. My hope is in you. Oh, the Spirit of God is here. The message of Jesus Christ that has lived throughout centuries, making dead things alive, making old things new, proclaiming liberty to the captives, Recovery of sight to the blind. Our God is here. We're going to read scripture together. Romans 5. I want to tell you something. There's something on my heart. And I sense this right now. That there are people who have been following God, maybe for a long time, maybe for a short time. But man, it's hard right now. It's hard. Life is hitting you. And maybe the term suffering maybe describes exactly where you're at right now. Jesus has something to say about that. Because in the name of Jesus Christ, suffering always, always, always ends in hope. We're going to read about that together. Romans 5. Let's all read this together. Here we go. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May we receive that as his church. Would you pray with me? Holy King, in the gathering of our church family, as we sing, as we make melody to you, worshiping you, Jesus, we just make the decision right now to throw off what may be holding us down into the pit. And we put on the newness of Christ in Jesus' name. That is joy and love and peace and patience 
and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. May you be honored today and may our hope be found in you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, let's sing one more song together. is my life. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear?
Priscilla, I love baptism weekend. It's like my favorite weekend. I, I, for some of us in this room, it's your practice, it's your routine to be here on the weekend. And, and it's good to, to worship and, and to hear the word of God. But for a few people that we just saw on the screen, today is a big day. It, it's, a, it's a stake in the ground moment. It's a line in the sand moment. It's a time where we exchange our wounding for his healing, when we exchange our despair for his hope, when we exchange our death for his life, and, and not just for those that are up there, but that's available to you too. You can take that step today to make that exchange with God, and because of that, he's worthy of our worship. So one more time, give a shout of praise, give a hand clap of praise to him, because he's worthy of it. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Hey, turn around, wave at somebody, welcome them to church this morning, and then you can have a seat. Man. What a morning already. Worship and seeing young people, people that are a little more seasoned taking that. I saw my man Justin up there got baptized. I didn't even know he was getting baptized. That was awesome. Man, I love that. Listen, I, my name's Lee. I'm up here with Priscilla. We want to welcome you today. We're so glad that you're here. Maybe you're watching online. Thanks for joining with us. Hey, if you're new, do us a favor. Maybe it's your first time here. Take your phone out and send a text message to the number 23101. We just want you to put there in the, in the text the word new. We're going to send you a Starbucks gift card. It's just us buying you a cup of coffee or some tea or maybe a cake pop or something. It's our way of saying thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here, and we would love to have you come back. That's right. I love a good cake pop. We a need to start having pop. those. Yeah. Whenever you do come back, I know there's a lot of people in the room that have been going to church on the move for a while, and maybe you don't yet feel connected to this church family. We want to invite you to a gathering that we do once a month called Next Move. Yeah. And listen, I'm going to keep talking about it every single week until every person in this room actually attends. So Let's you might as well just come. But the thing about Next Move is you get to hear directly from our lead pastor as he yeah. shares the mission and vision of Church on the Move. One of his favorite things that he gets to do is meet each one of you personally. Right. But Lee and I are both in there. We share a meal together. We take you behind the scenes. We have an absolute blast. Here's the challenge, though. Every single month, we've been maxing out Next Move capacity, and we've just been pulling in chairs. So this coming, at the end of this month, April 30th and May 1st, we're calling it Next Move Weekend. We're going to have a Next Move after the Saturday service and after this 10 a.m. service. So there's no excuse. So come join us. Text NEXT to 23101 and be a part of that with us. And I know some of you have been thinking about doing this for a while. Now's the time. Next Move Weekend, take that step. We want to connect with you, and we want to see you get connected into the life and the family of Church on the Move. Well, many of you know this, but it may be news to some of you. Tomorrow, we begin a 12-day fasting season as we lead up into Easter. There's a lot of different ways that we can fast, and, and you, you can grab a card on the way out. There's some suggestions there, but what are we doing? We, we're removing some things from our life. We're, we're stepping away from some things things that we're used to so that we can use that time to focus on God and honestly let him deposit some things in us that we might miss otherwise. We're excited about it. That's right. One of the ways that we want to help you do that is by creating space right here for you to come and pray with us. So yeah. we're going to open our doors Monday through Friday for the next two weeks. We've heard from a lot of you that are going to be fasting lunch. So yeah. that's a great time to come and join us between 1215 and 1245 right out here in the Triangle. Be with us in prayer. Like Lee said, we're removing some things with the intention to grow closer to God and honestly grow in connection with each other. So right. come join us for that. We'd love to see you. At Church on the Move, we believe that there are certain spiritual practices that help us be more transformed into the likeness of Jesus. We worship together. That, that's one. We, we dive into the Word of God. We let the Word of God speak to us. And it, it changes us in the process. We're talking about prayer. You could come and join us in the middle of the day for prayer. We believe that prayer connects us to God, and that makes a difference. But another one of those practices that we believe has transformative power is giving. That's why we do it regularly. Every week we have this time in our service when we give. It's not just a way to raise money for the church. It's a way in which we identify with the generosity and the character of God. And through the process, the practice of giving, we get transformed. We become more like Him. 
And we've all been so thankful for the generosity of God. We have a chance to, to make others thankful for the generosity of God through what we have. Many of you, you practice this. It's a part of your routine. But maybe some of you, you've, ne you've never taken this step. We would encourage you to do that with us today. We've got a couple of different ways that we do that around here. You can just text the word GIVE to 23101, and it'll give you instructions there on how you can give digitally. It's pretty easy to do. Or if you came prepared to give in the room, whether by cash or check, we've got drop boxes at all of our exits. You could just drop your gift in there. You know, there's something else that we do around here. Many of you know about it. It's called our compassion offering. Do we do it every year? It's a way in which we try and take funds to just be a blessing to the city of Tulsa, to Northeastern Oklahoma, and around the world. We've already raised well over a million dollars just this year in order to be that blessing to the kingdom and to the world. If you wanna give to that, you can just text the words, the letters C-O on that same text line and you can get instructions on how to give to the compassion offering. Man, I'm excited for Wit to come out here in week three of Fast Forward. But before we do that, Priscilla, would you pray for us? I would love to. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. What an honor it is to gather together with our church family just to worship you. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for the intentional time that we have to set aside some things in our life over the next 12 days as we prepare our hearts for Easter and the celebration of you. We give you the glory for what's to come today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Great to see everybody this morning at Church on the Move. Welcome to everybody joining us online. Also, welcome to our churches at Dr. Eddie Warrior and Dick Connor Correctional Center. Can we put our hands together, church family? Welcome them this morning. God bless you guys. It's been a great week at Church on the Move. We had an amazing brotherhood breakfast Friday morning with my dear friend, Blaine Bartell. In fact, biggest brotherhood breakfast we'd ever had, and it was just incredible. We, we spent probably, I don't know, 40 minutes chatting about Blaine's story, incredible story of really his life imploding and then God resurrecting him out of the ashes. Incredible, incredible story. We'll probably do uh, a podcast on it because honestly we could have probably talked to him for, I don't know, two hours. This story is that amazing. So just an incredible Brotherhood Breakfast and then Friday night we had a, our first ever LCS gala celebrating 25 years of Lincoln Christian School, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. 25 years our school's been going. And uh, just really cool what God's been doing there. And then, of course, uh, we're heading into Easter, this Easter season, and uh, super excited about that. Uh, I want to remind you, as I have been doing every week, that we have Easter service times a little bit different than normal weekend service times. Uh, we have a Good Friday service, April the 15th, at 6.30 p.m., and I fully expect this room to be packed for that service so if you're interested in being a part of it, you might get here a little bit early so that you can make sure that you can grab a seat. We'll be reading through the, uh, the crucifixion narrative and singing hymns together. And uh, it's a powerful, really, really powerful service. And so um, for me, that's just like an unmissable part of, of uh, my Easter weekend experience. And then Easter, we'll begin celebrating that Friday, uh, excuse me, Saturday night at 5 p.m. Of course, we normally have a 5 p.m. service on Saturday evenings. And then we'll do Sunday morning, 8.30 in this room, and then a 10 a.m. service like we're doing right now, and then 11.15 up at 180, which is the building kind of up the hill there. Some of you don't know that we regularly do a service there at 11.15 every single weekend, and uh, it's a great place to go for you and your kids. That building is incredible. I mean, it's just maybe the most like family-friendly building we have. If, if some of you, you come to this church and it feels kind of overwhelming and big for you in this room... That room is perfect because it's a little smaller, and uh, I preach up there live. This band is up there live. It's, it's all the same thing, just in a different space. And so anyway, 8.30, 10 a.m., and 11.15, I would encourage you, come to the service that you're able to bring someone to. But if you have a choice, avoid the 10 a.m., because this is the one that's going to be crazy. I fully expect this, this one to be kind of packed out, and uh, who knows what the others will be, but we're trying to kind of relocate people into the other services. And so as you leave today at all the exits, you might see these little invitations, and I would encourage you to grab some of these over the next couple of weeks, 
Great opportunity to pass these out to family, friends, invite somebody to join you for Easter weekend. People are obviously more open to coming to church on Easter weekend, and so this is gonna be a a really great story. In fact, I I just told you about Blaine's story that we shared at Brotherhood Breakfast. We're gonna be sharing that via video, a short version of that on video for Easter weekend, and it's gonna be powerful. So gonna be a great service, so grab these. Grab one, grab 10, doesn't matter. On the way out, just get a few of those uh, so you can pass them out. Now, one thing I'd love to ask for your prayers for personally, Uh, The day after Easter, Heather and I are leaving on a trip. Um, It's a school trip. Many of you know I'm pursuing a master's degree right now. In one of my last classes, second to last class, we're actually going to Rome, Greece, and Israel. How many of you are like, I'm in. I want to do this this study with you. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm excited about it. We're studying the New Testament, so Rome, Greece, Israel being key locations for where the New Testament was written. We're going to be there for about, I think, 10, 11 days. Uh, Heather and I will be going together. Obviously, kids will be staying back. And um, I'm excited about this, but also a little bit nervous just because, I don't know, anytime I'm away from my family for 10 days or my kids 10 days, it just, you know, it's tough for me. Heather's like, I'm good, let's go. But I... (laughs) I have a harder time with it. So um, for those of you, I know many of you, you you pray for us regularly. Uh, Thank you. I would love your prayers around this. And and two, I would love your prayers just that we get out of this everything that, I think this could be a life-shaping, life-transforming trip. I think this could be really significant. Some of you have been to the Holy Land before. You've experienced some of this. I'm really looking forward to uh, what God's going to do in this. But I just wanted to share that with you. So I won't be around right after Easter. That's where I'll be. And uh, I would love your prayers uh, while we're over there. Just be meaningful to to Heather and I. So anyway, all right, uh, John 15 is where we're going to take our text this weekend. We're going to look at the first five verses. If you brought a Bible, great. You can follow along. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version today. Um, If you didn't bring a Bible, all good. We will throw the slides up on the screen so you can follow along with me there. Jesus speaking in John 15, verse 1. He says this, I am... The true vine, one of several I am statements in the book of John. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, speaking of his father. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. I like the way the NIV says it, that it will be even more fruitful. I talk about that quite a lot around here. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, but also I believe he's looking down through history, speaking to us as well. He says this in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit, that is, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for speaking to us this weekend. Thanks for this teaching, this principle. Honestly, Lord, I think this spiritual practice we're going to talk about this weekend and this principle could be life-shaping for so many that hear it. So, Lord, give them ears to hear I pray that what I'm going to share today would, would go down deep in the heart, not just kind of connect with the mind and then sort of move on, but really hit us in the heart, something that we could remember, something that would stick with us, something that would challenge us, and honestly, Lord, lift us up in times of distress and trouble. We pray that you speak to us today by your Holy Spirit. We want to become more like Christ. It's in his name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, many of you know we're starting a fast on Monday. How many of you, you've already figured out what you're going to do for the 12-day fast? You've already got it kind of all sorted awesome. How many of you, you're still trying to figure it out? You're almost done, but you're, you're not exactly sure on everything. All right, cool. How many of you are like, what fast? What are you talking about? <laughs> Welcome to the party. We are starting a fast on Monday, 12-day fast. It will lead us right up to Good Friday. I'm asking everybody to participate a couple of different ways. One is a food fast. I'm asking you to do some measure of a food fast. Nothing like giving up some kind of food in order to pursue God. Food is life. And when we give up food, we're saying, food is not my life. My life comes from 
from God. He's the one that sustains me. Jesus is the one that sustains me. And so nothing like fasting food to point you to Christ. And so we're going to be doing that for 12 days. And people are doing it in lots of different ways. I, I talked to Pastor Seth, who's out at Church on the Move West. He's doing water and juice only for 12 days. Uh, Heather and I are going to be fasting sun up to sundown. We'll do nothing but liquids during that time, and then we'll eat in the evening. You may have your own version of this that you want to do, but I'm just challenging everybody to fast some kind of food over the next 12 days. And then we're doing a digital fast as well, where we're pulling back some of our kind of digital tethering. We're tethered to our devices, tethered to Netflix, tethered to the entertainment channels and the endless, honestly, entertainment channels that are so prevalent in the world that we live in today. And we're pulling back from that again so that we can pursue Christ heading into Easter. Nothing better, Easter being the holiest uh, kind of date on the Christian calendar. And we want to be ready for that, but not just ready for Easter, ready for what God is going to do next in our church, in our lives, in our businesses, in our homes, in our marriages. We want to be ready for God to move and God to do something significant. And so if you didn't get one of these uh, cards right here, it's called Fast Forward. You can grab this also on the way out. It will walk you through it. On the front side, it has the fast, the food fast, the digital fast. And then on the back side, you'll see it says choose your forward because this is a two-part process. There's a Bible reading plan. So there's some things we're giving up and there's some things we're taking on. And that's really the concept that I want to talk about today. Over the last three weeks, we've been talking about kind of the benefits of fasting. In week one, we talked about how fasting teaches us self-denial. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to learn to deny yourself. If you can't say no to yourself, you'll never be able to say yes to Jesus. And so fasting teaches us to develop that muscle of self-denial that honestly is so weak in our culture. We know how to say yes to ourselves. We're really good at saying yes to ourselves, of pushing off or put, taking on things that honestly we can't afford, that we don't have time for, but things we really want. It's just how we're wired up. But fasting teaches us how to say no. Really important spiritual discipline that we learn how to say no to ourselves. And then last week, we talked about how fasting points us to a deeper bigger spiritual reality. How fasting points us to the concept of surrender, something that God wants from us for, throughout our whole life. Surrender is the idea of giving up everything for God, of turning everything over to him, not just your sins. A lot of us in the American church are familiar with the idea of giving God our sins. We transfer to Jesus our past, our failures, the things we're not proud of, and obviously, Jesus takes those things from us. That's why the gospel is called good news. We get to give him our sins. But he wants more than just your sins. Jesus is more than your savior. He's also your king. And that means you trust him with your dreams, your hopes for your future. You trust him with everything. And that's what surrender is. It's the process of saying, all right, God, I'm giving you everything. Fasting points us to that big spiritual theme. It also points us to the big spiritual theme of submission, of learning to obey God and say yes to Christ even when we don't understand. If you're a parent, you already get this. There are things you see about your kids' lives that they can't see that you can't explain. Difficult to explain to a six-year-old why it's not great to have ice cream for dinner. But mom and dad understand the kind of long game and what's significant, what really matters. Kids often don't see that. How many of us, we're the exact same way with our Heavenly Father. In other words, as our intellect and our perspective is so much higher than our kids' intellect and perspective, so then is God's intellect and perspective so much higher above ours. And so we learn to submit by obeying even when we don't understand. Fasting, again, points us to that. And ultimately, all of this is teaching us and showing us God's process of sanctification, which is really how God makes you more like Jesus. That's the whole goal. Is one, you're being delivered from your sins, yes, but two, you're meant to become more like Christ. And so fasting points us to these things. And one of the ways that we do that is by removing things. Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles. And so fasting is the process or the act 
of giving some things up strategically, but it's not just a negative. In other words, fasting is about more than what you're just going to subtract from your life. It's also about what you're going to add to your life. So we're getting rid of some things over the next 12 days, but we're also hoping to add some new things back in. That's how God works. In fact, that's how salvation works, by the way. Jesus takes your sins, but he also wants to deposit in you his character. And fasting is a microcosm of that. And so Jesus, in John chapter 15, is talking about the things that we're adding back in. Let's look at the verses again together. In John 15, verse 2, let's start there again. He says this, every branch in me that, bears, that does not bear fruit, my Father takes away. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So that's the negative. In other words, we're pulling some things out for the purpose of being more fruitful. So he prunes us so that we can grow in our fruitfulness and do more for God and for his kingdom than what we were doing previously. That's verse two. Verse four, he says this. Abide in me. Now he's talking about the positive. So verse 2, he's talking about what we're removing. But in verse 4, he starts talking about what we're adding back in. And he says this, abide in me. That's the positive. And I in you. And then he goes on to unpack more specifically what that means. He says, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in in me. My daughter B is nine years old. She's our youngest, and from time to time she'll be outside playing in the yard, and she'll come back in having picked a handful of wildflowers to give to my wife Heather. And it's the sweetest thing. She'll come in with this kind of bunch of wildflowers, and she'll find Heather, and she'll say, Mom, these are for you. And so Heather will go over to the cupboard and open it up and grab out of there a mason jar and go over to the sink and fill it up with water and put those flowers in the water, in the jar, place the jar on the windowsill that goes just above the sink there. And for, I don't know, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, those flowers look great. But after a while, you know how this works, they start to fade, don't they? They lose their, their glory, their luster, they start to wilt and eventually they die. Why? Because they're cut off from the root. Jesus said, that's exactly how God made you. You're meant to be connected to the root. Jesus said, I am the root. When he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, that's exactly what he means. And, and here's how this works. You can go through stretches of your life where everything looks okay. Where outwardly, you don't seem to be wilting. You don't seem to be dying. In fact, maybe things look really good. But give it enough time and you, just like those flowers, will begin to fade unless you're connected to the life-giving root of Jesus Christ. He's where life comes from. So he says, if you're connected to me, then there's going to be life. He says, so abide in me. That's what that means. Stay connected to me. And then he unpacks it even further in verse 5. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears, let's read these two words together, much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. So he's building out for us this continuum here. On one end, we've got much fruit. And on the other end, we've got what? Nothing. Over here, much fruit. Over here, nothing. And he's saying, you get to choose, essentially. Your, your life kind of operates somewhere in this continuum between much fruit and nothing. Now, let's just talk for a second about what he means by nothing. Because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if we're honest, and we look down through history, we've seen a lot of people who have accomplished a great deal and had very little, if any, connection to Christ whatsoever. So what then does Jesus mean when he says, apart from me, 
you can do nothing. Well, when you read through the Gospels and you read the words of Jesus, he's continually pointing to his kingdom, talking about my kingdom, my kingdom, my kingdom. And in his kingdom, he talks about life is very different than this kingdom. In other words, the things that we glorify in this life, the things that mean so much in this reality, Jesus says in my kingdom, they don't mean the same thing. That's why Jesus would say things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. What he's pointing to is that we have a whole different set of values in kind of our worldly reality that Jesus has in his kingdom reality. And so he said there are people that in this life are going to be very successful, going to accomplish a great deal, and on the outside are going to look like they are somebody significant, but in the kingdom, they're last. They really haven't accomplished much of anything at all. So when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's saying, yeah, you could be busy. You might make a lot of money. You might have a lot of influence. You might have a lot of people working for you. A lot of people know your name. But in my kingdom, in my economy, you're not much. You haven't accomplished much because apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus gives us a choice in life. And I don't think it's a black and white choice either. I think there's a continuum here. Our lives, in fact, I think kind of move along this spectrum of much fruit and over here, nothing. But he gives us a kind of formula for how this works. Again, let's read verse five because it couldn't be more clear. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever, what is it? abides in me, and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So what then is the key to bearing much fruit? Church on the move, what is it? Abiding in me, yeah. So essentially, Jesus is giving us a formula. If you could kind of draw a circle in your life and go, this is the abide in Christ circle. Basically, what Jesus is saying is that your, your ability to bear much fruit is tied directly to how much time you spend in this circle. The much fruitedness of your life, if I could make a, a term up this morning, is directly attached to how much time you spend abiding in me. What then does it mean to abide in me. This is the positive. So we're going to remove some things, say, God, prune us, but where we want to end up is in this circle. Abide in me and I in you. And if you do that, Jesus said, you will bear much fruit. What then does it mean to abide in me? Well, I want to give you three quick thoughts. I, I could spend a long time on this, but I want to I want to just kind of give you an overview of what I think it means to abide. The first thing is this. I think having an awareness of God. Helpful for me to kind of cons uh, think about this through the lens of my relationship with Heather. When I'm being a good husband, I'm aware of my wife, aware of her needs, aware of her desires, her preferences. Maybe it's easier to say it this way. When I'm not being such a good husband, I'm not very aware of her desires, needs, and preferences. But when I'm, when I'm doing a good job as a husband, I'm thinking about her. Hey, how's this going to affect you? I'm thinking about what she likes, what her preferences are. I think it works the same way with God. I think we're called to live a life of awareness with God. In other words, where we're thinking about what does God want? What, 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 what's God's character like? How does, how does God treat people? What, what's God's thoughts on money? How does he think about relationships? I'm gonna have that awareness everywhere that I go. I'm constantly going to be thinking about who he is, his preferences, what he wants, and how I interact with him. But it's more than just an awareness. What I need more than awareness is presence. I think again about my relationship with my wife. If all I have is an awareness, but I don't spend any time in her presence, our relationship is going to be lacking. So Heather and I have to look for ways to spend time with one another. Honestly, it's just important to get face time with one another, even if we don't have anything particularly pressing to talk about. But we just get together with one another, and we're in each other's presence for an extended period of time. Relationship starts to feel stronger. You need that presence. It works the same way with God. You, you understand how this works. If you've got a friend, a spouse, 
Someone in your life, a family member that you haven't seen in a long time, what happens to the relationship? It starts to weaken. But when you spend time in someone's presence, the relationship gets stronger. So we need awareness, we need presence, and I think maybe above all else, we need trust. Trust is being able to say, man, I, I trust you. I trust your character. I know how you are. I, I have this with Heather. I know most of the time how she's going to react to things. I know most of the time what she wants. She's her own person. I can't predict everything. She's not some robot. But generally, I've got trust in how she is, what she'll do, how she'll respond to me. And there's a safety that comes in that in our relationship. Trust. If someone is wildly unpredictable and I never know how they're going to react, I don't have much trust with a person like that. So what I'm looking for is that kind of consistency. That's what we want with God. We want awareness, we want presence, and we want trust. And that's what it means, I think, to abide. To stay in this circle and have that kind of relationship with God. I'm aware of who he is, what he wants, how he, what he wants for me. I'm spending time in his presence. I've got a deep trust in him. That's abiding right there. But here's what I've learned in life. And maybe you've already learned this too. Is that you can have times or moments in your day when you're in the circle. And you're abiding in Christ, and he's abiding in you. But how many of you have learned that it doesn't take a whole lot to knock you out of the circle? I played golf yesterday morning. And by the, yeah, and by the end of the first hole, the circle was nowhere in sight. <laughs> I'm not even sure I was saved anymore. <laughs> Falling completely outside of the circle. It, it doesn't take much. Strong emotions, difficult circumstances can move us outside the circle. You wake up, you start your day, you're reading scripture, you're spending time with God, and then something happens with one of the kids. You get into an argument at work, or your husband calls you, and that conversation doesn't go well. You get some financial news, you go to the doctor. I mean, there's any number of things that, oh wow, everything's going great, and then boom, Life happens, and before you know it, I'm outside the circle. The trick is this. Again, if we want to bear much fruit, it's going to come down to how much time we can spend in this circle. And when you look at the life of Christ, and when you read through the Gospels, what you see is someone who was, no matter what came his way, intimately connected to his Father in this circle. That's our pattern of life. How do we do that? Through the ups and the downs of life. What I want to do today is give you a life hack to help you stay in that circle. Dear friend of mine and a friend of Church on the Move, many of you will know Dave Jewett. He's not a, a, a member here at COTM, but he is a big fan of COTM and has served our, our staff and teams and me so well. In fact, I, I'll just for the last, I don't know, three, four years, Dave will call me up and say, hey, can we go to lunch? And we'll just sit down and talk. And, you know, Dave's in his 70s. God's been working in and through him for so many years. And it's just great to be around somebody that kind of has that sort of track record and can pour into you. And so, I don't know, Dave shared this with me probably three times, but this this one, I just call it like a life hack for staying in the abiding circle has meant so much to me. In fact, it's a practice that I'm trying to implement more and more and more in my life that I want to pass on to you today. So this is going to be incredibly practical because I know everybody in the room is like, yeah, I want that. I want to be in the circle. The, the struggle is, is that it's easy to get knocked out. How do I stay in? He's given me a thought, honestly, that I think is, well, revolutionary. I think it can transform your ability to be able to stay planted in the circle of abiding. And it's really simple. I mean, it's just so simple. But how many of you know that the simple things aren't always the easiest things? Super simple. I want to give you a prayer to pray when you pray. One question that I want you to ask God and then listen. And it's simply this. God, how do you want me to trust you right now? When life is knocking you out of the circle, when you get hit with a wave of bad news, a difficult circumstance, one of the kids is haywire, things with husband, not great, 
Things on the job not going the way that you want. I want to give you one simple question to pray. Honestly, I think it can be a game changer if you'll really pray this on, on a regular basis. God, how do you want me to trust you right now? Now, I know this seems simple, but I want to walk you through both the positive and the negative kind of what would I say, reaction or chain reaction to what happens when we do and when we don't pray like this and what it leads to. And hopefully, as we kind of walk through these steps, you'll begin to see some patterns that maybe have played out in your life that lead all the way back to honestly praying and asking this question, God, how do you want me to trust you right now? Now, let me first show you how this works in the negative. Because if we're being honest, it's not uncommon for believers and unbelievers alike to when life hits them hard that they pray. And we turn to God. Not uncommon for us to turn to God and say, help, I don't know what to do. God, if you're up there, please react, do something. Like I said, Christians and non-Christians are willing to pray that prayer when life becomes too much for them. But I want to challenge you to pray beyond that. I want to challenge you to pray with trusting, which is exactly what we're going to talk about. And it's this little hack I'm talking about. How do you want me to trust you right now? But the reality is, is that most of us, when we pray, we don't actually pray and trust. We just pray. God, help. Where are you? God, why? What's going on? Let me show you how this works. Here's the pattern. When we pray without trusting, we kind of start what I would call like a downward trajectory. It's like taking a staircase down. We start praying without trusting, but when we pray without trusting, go ahead and put the slide up, guys. When we pray without trusting God, here's what it leads to. It leads to what Dave calls burden bearing. In other words, we're taking on weights and responsibilities that aren't ours to take. I'm just going to pause right here and I say, I, I would tell you, I think this is an epidemic in Christianity. So many people I run into, the source of their problem is that they're bearing a burden that's not theirs to bear. We've prayed, God, why? God, what's up? But we've not transferred our burden or put our trust in God that he's going to deal with it. We're still holding on to the problem. So we say, God, what's up with the kids? God, what's going on in my marriage? God, what's going on financially? God, what's going on in my body? But we're holding on to it. And so we end up bearing a burden that's not ours to bear. I, I remember, gosh, a couple of years ago, probably late fall 2020, it was the election season. I had a church on the mover text me, just bothered, deeply bothered by things he was seeing. What about this? He had all these questions. What about this? And what about this? And it was all this speculative stuff, like what might happen? Well, they're going to do this, and they might do that. And so I just responded with the words of Jesus from Matthew 6. Do not worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. He was like, yes, I know, but what about this? What about that? What's going to happen over here? And I just, I sent the same verse back again. Do not worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. You know what I'm convinced of? We don't treat that verse nearly seriously enough. It's a direct command. Do not, Jesus said, worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, what if we took the command, do not worry about tomorrow, as seriously as we take the command, do not commit adultery? Do not, see, we kind of give ourselves a free pass to worry because oh, it's not that big of a deal, or shouldn't I, after all, be concerned about these things? Jesus says, do not do it. You know why? Because when you worry about tomorrow, you're taking God's responsibility for yourself. Your job is today, God's job is tomorrow. Your job is to be faithful now, today. God's job is to be faithful into the future. He's got that. So you just have to go, I can only control what's happening right now. So I'm going to release tomorrow to God, and I'm going to trust you 
that you've got me. But the vast majority of us, we don't do this. We hold on to the burden. And you know what it leads to? So you pray without trusting. Then you end up bearing a burden. Number three, the step down, the downward spiral, is that we end up weary and fatigued. You start feeling tired. Well, that's what happens when you bear a burden that you're not meant to bear. I see this with so many, I sat down with a young man this week, Church on the Move, great young man. But he was tired. And some of it was to do with his you know, physical work practice and some things there needed to change, but some of it was to do, maybe much of it was to do with the fact that he was bearing a burden that wasn't his to bear. Taking responsibility for things that are not his things to take responsibility for. He was talking to me about God's given me all these dreams and I've, I, I can see kind of where he wants me to go and what he wants me to do and I just, I'm just, I'm just, he's just carrying this weight of trying to make all of that happen and I just said, buddy, that's not your job. Your job is to be faithful where God's planted you right now. But when we try to make it all happen, guess what? We end up wearing ourselves out. Can I just tell you something that I heard from Pete Scazzaro, pastor in New York, I think is amazing. He said, your body is a major prophet. Meaning your body speaks to you. Some of you, your bodies have been trying to tell you for a while that you need to slow down. That you're pushing too hard. I have friends who've ended up in the hospital, thought they were dying of a heart attack. Turns out it was a panic attack. All because they were pushing themselves so hard. Stress can kill you, quite literally. And it's your body's way of saying, stop. Some of you young people, you push yourselves to the limit. You go, 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 until literally, and I've seen this with my own kids, you just crash. Well, you're sleeping for 24 hours plus, you're pushing too hard. You need a more regular rhythm in your life. Weariness is your body's way of telling you, slow down. You're bearing burdens that are not yours to bear. So we need to kind of keep an eye on this and watch for this because it's not just our body's way, but honestly, I think it's God's way of trying to get our attention. We pray without trusting. We end up bearing burdens that are, are not ours to bear. We end up weary and fatigued. And then what happens after that? Now we end up discouraged. We're losing hope. I don't know that anything's ever going to change. This is just how it always works out for me. Nothing ever seems to pan out. I'm just always in this situation. You're losing hope. You're bearing a burden that's not yours to bear. You're fatigued and you're tired. Now it's leading you to a place where you're losing hope. And after you've lost hope, you end up in the next step of the spiral downward, which is you end up feeling disillusioned or disillusionment which is more than just losing hope. Now, you're starting to lose belief. And you find yourself feeling cynical, cynical about things that you used to have high hope and trust and faith in, but you're starting to feel cynical about it now. You're in this stage, disillusionment. And the problem with disillusionment and walking through some measure, and I'm not talking about you're just tossing all of your faith out, but you're, you're, you're just, you're kind of cynical about what God can do, what he would do, at least maybe what he would do with you. And when you find yourself in that place, it's very difficult to reach out to other people. So you end up doing the next thing on the downward spiral, which is you isolate yourself. And now you're alone. And you're a prime candidate for the final stage of the journey, which is exactly where the enemy wants you. Disaster. Man. When you look at pastors these days, and how many stories do we need to hear of yet another pastor who has failed, failed his marriage, failed his church, failed to lead with integrity? What is the pattern of failure that we see? I promise you. If you could dig into their personal lives, you would see something like this. Bearing burdens that aren't ours to bear. It's easy to do in the ministry because we're doing God's work, but we end up taking on God's work and not letting God do what God wants to do. 
And by putting too much pressure and responsibility on ourselves, we wear ourselves out. When we get tired, we get discouraged. When we get discouraged, we find ourselves facing disillusionment. And when we're there, we're isolated and we are prime candidates for disaster. Happens all the time. In fact, happening with greater uh, frequency these days. Why? Because we're pushing harder than we should, bearing burdens that are not ours to bear. It all goes back to a failure to trust God, to live in the circle. God, how do you want me to trust you right now? See, there's a difference between just crying out to God, help, and asking God, how do you want me to trust? Because that answer could be different. God can show up in different ways when we're saying, how do you want me to trust you right now? He may give you an action. He may say, I want you to do this. Or he may just say, I need you to wait. He may remind you of his faithfulness in the past. It's a great story that Dave told me about his own personal life and experience with praying and asking this question. He said years ago, he said, have you ever run a nonprofit before? And maybe most of us in the room never have, but when you're running a nonprofit, you don't always know where next month's income is gonna come from. It's just, you know, you're relying on donations. And he said, so he'd come to a particular month and he had forgotten to pay his quarterly taxes. He said, not only did I forget to pay my quarterly taxes, but I I didn't have the money to pay what I owed. You don't wanna get in a situation where you're owing the government money like this, the IRS money, and you don't have it. And so he was terrified, quite honestly, at what was you know, the prospect of of trying to pay this bill and not having the money to do it. And so he cries out to God, God, help. But then he remembers, how do you want me to trust you right now? I feel like God's speaking to us in this moment. (laughs) Anyway, this is a regular occurrence around here. We've got this airstrip down here, and so we see these I don't know, F-16s flying around. It's kind of cool, honestly, during the day. Not so great during the middle of your sermon. But anyway, (laughs) so he's praying and he's asking God, God, how do you want me to trust you? And God begins to speak to him and he says, haven't I always provided for you, Dave? Haven't I always taken care of you? And then he told him this. He said, don't you realize, Dave, that I'm the one that tells people to give to this ministry, not you? I've got you. He said, all right, I'm going to trust. He said, later that afternoon, within a couple of hours, he got a phone call from his business administrator. She said, you know, I'm sure you already know this, but just in case you hadn't heard, there's been a check floating around here for $107,000 that we haven't gotten around to cashing yet. Just thought you might want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Tears, Dave said, coming down his cheeks. God, thank you. What was that? There was an opportunity to trust. See, there's a different trajectory. When you pray without trusting, you're walking downward and toward disaster. But there's a different trajectory that begins when we learn to pray with trusting. God, how do you want me to trust you right now? Let's look at this because it's really the opposite of what happens when we pray without trust. When we pray and trust God, it leads to a freedom. Instead of bearing a burden, we now feel free because we've been able to transfer onto God the thing that we've been carrying. And can I just give you a practical tip? I've been in this situation so many times. There are moments of my life where I felt like it was more than I could handle. It was more than I knew what to do with. I've had situations, arguments, difficulties with family, friends, people I'm working with, where whenever I'm feeling all of that stress, I don't know about you, but that situation or that conversation plays on repeat in my mind. I'm going over it and over it and thinking about what I wish I would have said or what I'm gonna say next time. I get to talk to that person. You know what I have to do? Maybe a 100 times in a day, I have to say to myself, no, I'm done, I'm letting that go. And then 10 seconds later, my mind's back into it again. No, I'm done. God, I'm giving that to you. And it doesn't go away in a moment. It doesn't stop even in an hour. Sometimes it takes hours. But eventually, I've done the hard work of transferring that on to Christ, and I can move on letting him deal with it. And there's a freedom that comes in that, because I'm not trying to deal with it all myself. 
So I pray and trust, God, how do you want me to trust you right now? There's a freedom that comes from that. Now, rather than feeling fatigued and weary, look at this, I feel energized because I've been able to give that to God. I'm starting now to feel more hopeful. Rather than discouraged, I'm hopeful. Why? Because I can hardly wait to see how God's going to come through. Rather than feeling disillusionment and a loss of belief, now I'm feeling focused because I know that God's got a plan and a purpose for my life. Out of that focus comes kingdom impact, where I'm making a real difference. And finally, what that leads to is a finish of well done, good and faithful servant. Now go ahead and leave that slide up there for just a second because we got people trying to write this down feverishly and some people trying to take a picture of this and you totally can. Get it while it's up there. This is the opposite of what it means to, trust God, or to, to pray without trusting. It is to pray with trusting and it, and it leads to kingdom impact and that even more fruitfulness that Jesus describes in John 15. Gang, can I tell you, I've lived this multiple occasions. I've seen God come through. In fact, this week when Dave was sharing this with us again, I've heard this many times, but when he was just walking it through with us again, I was just reminded, in fact, I was so encouraged at how faithful God has been. I remember in 2020, right in the middle of all the crazy that was going on that summer, I was walking on a daily basis, about an hour couldn't go anywhere else, you know? We were all stuck in our homes. I was walking through my neighborhood, just trying to get out and move a little bit, but also just needed some time to pray, to deal with all the stress, the anxiety, the pressures that I was facing trying to lead this church through the most tumultuous cultural time in my lifetime. And I found myself one day particularly praying about my future. Um, it had been a really hard week, I'll be honest with you. I can't go into all of the details, but there was just a lot that was causing me stress and much that was causing me to question my future at Church on the Move, whether or not I was the guy to lead COTM into the future. I wasn't wanting to abandon my post or run away because it was hard. I, I was honestly trying to be a good steward of this church, and I was curious and wondering, honestly, asking God, God, am I the guy for this? I, I don't know if I'm the right person to lead here and lead through this. And I still remember right where I was in my neighborhood praying and crying out to God and, God, and, and saying to God, I, I, I don't know if, if I can keep this up. I can't lead like this indefinitely. I need to know, do you want me here? Am I supposed to be here? And so I was just asking God for an answer. I walked for a good hour that morning. And when I came home, no sooner did I get home and make it to my backyard than my dad called. And it was the exact conversation and confirmation that I needed to say, you need to stay. What is that that's putting your faith and trust in God and letting God show up. I got story after story after story like that of where I say, I, I don't know what the future is. I don't know how it's all gonna work out. And then God shows up. If he did it for me, church, he'll do it for you. God wants to be your provider. He wants to connect with you and your moments of anguish and anxiety. He wants to be there for you, to come through for you. But in order to do that, we've gotta be able to trust him and say, okay, I can't make it all happen. I'm gonna need to hear from you. I'm gonna need you to show up. I'm gonna need you to come through. And here's what I can tell you. He always, always, always does. Not always like you want him to. Not always at the time that you'd like for him to. But in the end, he always, always, always comes through. And my hope is that over this next 12 days that we begin tomorrow, that we start to learn how to lean on and trust, abide in him. I in you, Jesus said. And when we do that, we will bear much fruit. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you 
for this life-shaping, life-transforming principle. I pray, Lord, that in our moments where life wants to knock us outside of the circle of abiding, Lord, that you would bring this question to our minds. Right in the middle of arguments, tension, stress, worry, that we would just right there where we are, quietly pray, Lord, how do you want me to trust you right now? And Father, as we pray that prayer in faith, we're counting on you to answer, to reply. We want to hear your voice. In fact, Father, I pray that these, your sheep in this room and watching online, and that Dick Connor and Eddie Warrior, Lord, they hear your voice, and the voice of a stranger they do not hear. But they would know that you're speaking to them down deep on the inside. And then, Lord, they would see the result of listening to you. They would watch and see you come through, and their faith would be strengthened in you. They would have a greater confidence in you that as storms come in their life, they would stand strong because they know your faithfulness. They would trust you. Lord, we commit as a church over these next 12 days to abide in you. You abide in us. And we will be a congregation that as a result bears much fruit. For apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing. Now, Heavenly Father, this morning I pray for anybody that might be in the room or watching online that does not know you. It's not in right relationship with you, not living for you, not having Jesus at the very center of their lives. Lord, would you help me to find them this morning and bring them home into relationship with you? Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning, you say, wait, I'm not right with God. Jesus is not the center of my life. Maybe you believe in Jesus. A lot of people around here believe in Jesus, but Jesus is not the center. He's not king, and you're ready to make him king and Lord of your life. If that's you in the room this morning, you say, wait, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. Maybe for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. If that's you, would you just wave at me? I want to pray with you and for you here in just a second. I'm not going to have you get up. I'm not going to have you come forward. Yes, sir, I see you right over there. Thanks for your hand lifted there in the floor section. I appreciate you. Anybody else? Yep, right down front. I see you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Jesus needs to be Lord and Savior. Yep, up there, too, in the top. I see you up there. One on the right side by the booth up there. Yep, I see you waving at me. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm ready to make Jesus Lord and Savior today, right on the aisle there. I see you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Over in the riser section over here. Awesome. Yeah, I see you right there. Front row. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Might take me a second to find you, but I will. I want to be able to pray with you. Somewhere down in the front here. Can't see it just yet. Might take me a second to see your hand. I don't see you just yet. All right. Anybody else? Yep, right there. Riser, I see you. Thank you. God bless you. Awesome. Anyone else? Where at? Yep, right over here. Yeah, young man, I see you. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Today's my day. I'm ready to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Yep, I see you right there. Thank you. Young lady right here in section to my left. Awesome. Anybody else? A lot of hands going up this morning. I don't want to miss you, so don't miss this chance. Anybody else? Today's your day. I'm ready to receive Christ. Anyone at all? Awesome. All right, we're going to pray together today like I told you that I would. Father, thank you for these that have raised their hands. Thank you. Thank you for meeting them right where they're at, for connecting them into this community, connecting them to brothers and sisters, in fact, just the right relationships to walk with them so that their faith, confidence in you could be strengthened, that what they're beginning today, Father, you would complete in Jesus' name. Name. Now, church, we're going to pray out loud together an affirmation of our faith. We pray this every week. Some of us have prayed this hundreds of times. For some of you, this might be the first time you've really meant a prayer like this. I'm going to invite us all to pray this out loud. Would you just repeat this after me? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. I confess I am a sinner. I need a Savior. And Jesus came. For me, I believe he was raised from the dead. I confess Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus, take my life, my past, my present, my future. I am completely yours. Thank you, Jesus, 
for saving me. Amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate all the hands that were lifted this morning and last night and in the next service? God bless you guys. Now, here's what's going to happen. As we dismiss, our prayer team's going to be down front. These are friends of mine, great people within this church that love to be able to bear burdens of congregants here, family here that are going through things together. And so if you raise your hand, here's what I want you to do. Come down front. We would love to be able to connect with you and pray with you today before you leave. Get you connected into the life of this church. And so anyway, if you'll stop down here, we would love to be able to do that. And if you're going through something today, maybe you're facing a real need right now and you need to pray and trust, but you don't want to do that alone. We've got our prayer team down here for you as well. If you're going through maybe something physically, something financially, something with one of the kids, got a big job interview, I don't know what it might be, we would love to be able to agree with you in prayer. So stop by here and uh, let us pray for you. All right, stand to your feet. Don't forget, grab some Easter invitations on your way out. These are great for family, friends, people that you want to bring with you to Easter weekend here at Church on the Move. Coming up in just, what, 13 days? It's going to be a great weekend. All right, let's throw our blessing up on the screen and uh, close our service the way that we do every week. You ready? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.